So uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, finish going over the, the kind of the classes of theories that people have for the Industrial Revolution, and then go on and start talking about, well, the actual Industrial Revolution, the events of the Industrial Revolution, does it favor <laughs> any one of these theories? And what you'll see is that, as I say, this is the great event in world history, and we'll see when we see the Industrial Revolution itself that there are very powerful reasons why it remains, uh, in some ways, a very mysterious event. And so just to remind you, since it's last week since we looked at this, uh, the important thing is that all explanations really can be put into these three classes. There are explanations which posit some exogenous shock to the economic system, something that comes from outside the economic system, from politics, culture, religion, that somehow then sparks economic growth. Uh, the huge problem with any such explanation is that it really just pushes things back one step because then you've got to say, well, why did, say, that political shock only occur in England in the 18th century? Why was it not possible in any other society before that to have the same political configuration when you've got this whole range of different societies to look at uh, beforehand? Okay? Um, if it's a religious shock, again, you get exactly the same kind of thing. Something. Well, why does it come uh, exactly there? Okay. Um, a second class of shocks is, are going to be these ones about multiple equilibria, which is to say it's going to fall somehow inside the economic system. It's something to do with the economic incentives that people face. But somehow the earlier society just didn't generate any incentives for people either to invest in technological advance, undertake innovation, uh, undertake the things that are necessary for economic growth. But somehow <laughs> you could switch just by a relatively small shock into a new configuration of, of the social system whereby the incentives for growth become very powerful. And the idea then would be that we could be very similar societies before and after the Industrial Revolution, but there's just a significant enough change in a few variables that in one society, no growth ever occurs. In the other society, growth is continually occurring. Okay? And again, the problem you're going to run into with this as a class of explanation is that if it's only a very small shock that's needed to move you from one equilibrium to the other, which makes it more plausible, then the problem would be, well, why didn't any other earlier society experience that small shock, right? I mean, if it's just some random shock that's going to hit the society. So one argument that's been made for England in this period is it's just that wages became relatively high and capital costs became relatively low. And that induced people then to look at technologies that could substitute for labor, and that turned out to be a productive area of investigation. Then the puzzle is going to be, well, ancient, ancient Athens wages also seem to have been relatively very high. <laughs> Why weren't they investing in spinning and weaving technologies in the same way as Britain in this period? And so if it's a small shock, the problem would be, well, why didn't it occur sometime earlier? If it's a really major shock, that's needed to shift you from one equilibrium to the other equilibrium, then in some sense you're back to this explanation here because now you need some substantial exogenous shock to hit the society and the, the question would be why only then, <laughs> right? Why only after 100,000 years did this finally, this, the correct shock hit? And then the last class of explanations are these ones that in, emphasize endogenous growth. And this is the idea that somehow the economic system is evolving over time. It has a motion, it has a dynamic to it, and the state of the system is changing, and eventually you reach a state where you launch into a period of growth. And something had to be kind of evolving in the earlier economy, moving you consistently in this direction. And here you need an explanation of well, why do you move in one direction as opposed to the other direction? Why don't economies just devolve, right? Uh, and, uh, and here, it, it turns out that in the Malthusian era, one of the problems is that most of the economic variables are static. Right? Living standards are static, life expectancy is static, birth rates seem to be static. A lot of the th society is just replicating itself, it's not changing. But the one key variable 
that does change uh, is the size of the population. Because any technological advance results simply in larger population stock in this world. And so the argument is simply made that, well, as population gets bigger and bigger, then just by the same rate of technological advance from any individual, you'll actually have socially this constantly increasing rate of introduction of new ideas. There's just more possibilities going up. See? And in most plausible interpretations, actually, those new ideas would arrive as a, as a function of the square root of the population. And the problem is that if you have more people, they'll keep inventing stuff that other people have already invented, right? That there'll, there'll be duplication. And so as you add more people, you don't, you know, if you double the number of people, you don't double the number of new ideas. It'll increase more slowly because it's got to be something different that someone else then thought of. Um, and what we'll see here is that, uh, the, uh, and, and then the other explanation that's actually given in the book is it's not just the population stock that's changing in the Malthusian era. It's the culture and even the biology of people in that era are changing <coughs> under this Malthusian mechanism, that people are adapting to market economies. They're becoming better able to operate within these economies, and that you're at least getting this cultural and, and, and also this uh, genetic drift in the population, uh, and that that, again, could be a source of uh, growth. Now, um, that's, the, that's the possibilities. Um, in terms of this exogenous shock, the thing that people are mainly thinking about is the idea that it's somehow it's the right institutions are discovered that promote economic growth. And, it's the, and the reason that people think about that is that England in 1800 had what economists regard as very good set of institutions in terms of growth. It had a government that was largely dedicated to free market uh, principles. Okay? It still had import restrictions, it still had trade restrictions, but in comparative perspective, it was actually a society where the government is very strongly committed to the operation of uh, markets. And this arises in a very powerful way in this period in that new, when we'll see the, the innovations that come in in the Industrial Revolution period often spark violence and rioting. Uh, because as workers are displaced in this period, they don't just go down to the local labor exchange and look for a new job. Uh, they take up cudgels and they attack the new machines and the new factories that uh, uh, lead to this. And in fact, there's a famous character from the Industrial Revolution period. Uh, there's a term, Luddite, which is, I hope most of you know, is the term for people who oppose new ideas or new technology. Well, this is actually not a biblical term. It's allegedly named after a specific person, Ned Ludd, who was a stocking frame weaver from the center of England around about 1800, who led riots against these new stocking frame uh, designs and machines. Uh, and so this was a period, the Industrial Revolution, where there's a lot of, as, as things start changing, there's a lot of displacement of workers. They introduced mechanical sawmills. There are all these hand sawyers now who are out of work. They introduced uh, spinning machines where all these hand spinners are out of work. They introduced powered weaving machines. There's weavers who are now out of work. And some, in Britain in the 1800s, there were something like 250,000 hand weavers. Uh, and that's a very substantial share of the population who within 30 or 40 years had all lost their livelihoods as a result of the introduction of factory weaving and who slump, went into uh, significant poverty and died very poor. And as I say, these people would often riot against the new machines and attack the new machines. And you see that the innovators in this period, when we look at the Industrial Revolution, often had to face this uh, problem. The government consistently, and in every case, simply called out the troops to suppress the rioters. Uh, and in the period, uh, say, um, uh, 1790 to 1815, a lot of time the government is engaged in this war with the French and in the struggle for domination in Europe. At various times in that period, it had more troops in the field in England suppressing rioters than it had actual troops fighting on the continent against the French. And so the government just always sided with innovation, with the property owners, 
with progress, and, and it really has this, and, it, and the other thing is the government is incredibly stable. It doesn't have to fear uh, violence. It doesn't have to fear popular protest. In some sense, it's more resistant to these pressures than many modern governments are. And in fact, there's a nice counterexample to this, which is, you know, as I say, the Britain let mechanical weaving come in and displace a huge fraction of its population. Uh, India faced this same problem in the 19th and 20th century with the introduction of factory weaving from uh, Britain. The Indian government has consistently protected hand weavers so that there's still a very substantial hand weaving industry in India 200 years after that became mechanically uh, obsolescent. And in order to protect that industry in India, the government was forced to tax very heavily the output of factories, to ban machinery imports, to subsidize payments to these poor weavers. It turns out they're all still incredibly poor. They're living on the margins of subsistence, but they've been maintained in existence for an additional 100 or 150 years by the activities of the government. And it just shows this very different uh, kind of uh, pattern between these two types of societies. Another nice example in India is that there's often political pressure on the government to have, if you're in a small town, you want the trains to stop at your town. Uh, and on the other hand, if you're running a railway network and you want efficient transportation, you want to have fast trains that go between the major centers. It turns out in India, the government's been unable to resist the pressure from small towns, at least until recently, so the express trains <laughs> stop everywhere on the way between one place and the other. They're incredibly slow. Their average speed is like 50 miles an hour, uh, simply, again, because of the, the power of political pressure by people. Okay? And so the interesting thing here, then, is that this idea is that somehow Britain had the right set of institutions in this period, and other societies were, were unable to achieve these. That raises a question, though, which is very powerful with regard to institutions, which is, Institutions are just rules, right? They're just the rules that govern society. It, in some sense, it doesn't cost anything to simply declare we're going to have good institutions as opposed to bad institutions. Okay? And in terms of as a way of changing societies, they're incredibly cheap, right? That's why economists love them, <laughs> because you can go to other countries and say, if you just change these rules, you will have wealth instead of poverty, right? It's an incredible elixir. Uh, that you can offer to societies. And you actually see, if you look at things like, say, uh, sports, uh, sports are games that are played with a set of rules, and often you know, the outcome will be pretty boring. Right? If anyone knows about soccer, uh, there are so many games that end in a score of zero to zero. Right? Well, if you don't like that outcome, you can just change the size of the goal. Right? <laughs> or you can narrow the penalty area, or there's all kinds of things you can do. And you see that sports leagues all the time start flittling with these rules in order to achieve uh, a different set of uh, outcomes. Right? And so in some sense, societies governed by institutions are governed by a set of rules. And if you don't like the economic outcome, then why not change the economic rules? And so the puzzle with any explanation that's going to say that the Industrial Revolution is the result of some kind of exogenous shock to institutions is that you have to then have a theory as to why people stuck with bad institutions. Why would it be that all societies before 1800 had a commitment to institutions that prevented economic growth? There have to be something systematic about institutions that leads people to favor these bad institutions. And one problem is that if any institution, I mean, we think of the economy as consisting as a kind of a pie, an output. If you have bad institutions, that output is less than it could potentially be. Right? You're restricted to this smaller output than you could potentially produce. If you change the institutions and get more output, then you can compensate everyone who lost out because of that institutional change. So for example, in Britain, in the period of the Industrial Revolution, if the government thought mechanical weaving is something that will increase the output of society and we should do that regardless of the effects it has on the handloom weavers, 
it could always also have taxed the factories producing mechanical output and then used the money from that to buy out the hand loom weavers and simply said, here's a one-time payment, go cultivate ducks or do something else until you die. Uh, and we're buying you out of this system. And people would say, that's great. OK, now I don't have to work. I simply get the payment. And so the other puzzle, as I say, with, with institutional shocks is that there should be very powerful forces in any society pushing institutions towards the ones that maximize the output of the society, simply because the gainers, in principle, should be able to reward the losers from this uh, interaction. And so in order to have this as the explanation of the failure of growth, you also need to have an explanation of the persistence of poor institutions. Okay? And let me show you an example of, a, of exactly even institutions that are quite dramatically bad, we would think, would just be ended by free market systems. And so in the pre-industrial world, slavery was a common institution. Okay? It's found in the American South. It's found in Brazil in the 19th century. It's found a, a, a variety of slavery. Serfdom is found in Eastern Europe and in Russia, persists until the 1860s as well. Brazil, it persists until the 1880s. It's found in the ancient world. It's found a little bit in societies like India or China. It's found in Africa. And so the claims are uh, that the, the normal expectation is that slavery is a, is a very poor economic institution. And the idea is, well, the slave has no incentives, right? They have no incentive to work hard. Uh, they uh, will work very poorly. The, the word robot, which we use now for a mechanical worker, actually derives from the Czech word for coerced labor of serfs, <laughs> right? Because robot labor was the kind of labor that you had to do for the Lord. And so you were required to work for three days a week for the Lord. And so that, that was the kind of labor where no one has any interest in performing it. Okay? And, but the argument would be if slavery really was an inefficient institution globally, slavery should just have died out on its own. And we actually see in various societies that slavery just disappears without any emancipation movement. So in ancient Rome, around about uh, the time of Christ, uh, a large fraction of the population of Italy are slaves who've been captured in various wars. Within two or 300 years, there seem to be almost no slaves left in Italy. And so the interesting thing is that, as I say, the Romans had no emancipation movement. They didn't feel bad about slavery. The only time they felt bad about slavery would be if they were enslaved and it was someone else who was the master. I mean, they had no problem with this idea uh, uh, ethically of slavery, but yet slavery disappeared. And similarly, in England, if you go back to 1200, a large fraction of the population are actually serfs on the manners of lords. They're bound servants who have to buy permission to leave the manor, have to buy permission to marry their daughters, have to buy permission for anything. Without, again, any emancipation movement in England, by 1500, there are almost no serfs left. They've simply disappeared in English society. And so the interesting thing would be, if slavery is inefficient, why would it actually persist as a system in many societies? And here's the specific argument about how slavery would, would simply uh, disappear. Suppose in a slave society, the output that you get, the marginal output you get from a slave is Ys. And suppose that it costs an amount Ws just to maintain their physical health. Then the profits from maintaining the slave system will be Ys minus Ws. And so the system could actually be profitable for the owners of the slaves. But if slavery is inefficient, then it must be the case that the wage of a free worker is greater than the output of a serf or a slave. That's what it would mean for the system to be inefficient, is that free workers are just much more effective. They work much better than slaves or serfs do. And Consequently, the, the wage of a free worker has to be greater than the output, the marginal output, right? So this is the marginal product of the uh, serf. Okay? In that case, the argument would be 
look, if I'm a serf, I could go to my master and say, free me. In return, I'll pay you every year this amount of money, okay, or somewhat more than that amount of money. And I can easily do that because since my wage in the free labor market is greater than this amount here, I can easily get my subsistence and have enough money left over to pay off the Lord, and in fact more than pay off the Lord, and still have some surplus for myself. And so the argument would be if that slavery really was an inefficient system in all cases in the pre-industrial world, then there would have actually been an incentive for the masters and the slaves to have done this deal whereby the masters simply say to the slaves, go ahead, go find yourself a job, and all you have to do is make that payment all the time. And in fact, that's exactly what happened in places like ancient Athens. There's a lot of slaves there who actually work on their own, live on their own, and simply have to remit a payment every year to the master. They control their own lives. That can also be a hereditary payment. It can be that your children then are also burdened with this payment. Or what could happen is, that the slave could actually buy themselves out completely. They could raise enough money <laughs> that they could simply say to the master, I want to extinguish this obligation. I'll pay you more than it's worth getting this annual payment from me. And that slaves would actually emancipate themselves under these societies. And that that's why slavery would actually end if slavery was systematically an inefficient institution. right? And that you wouldn't explain the lack of economic gro growth later through slavery because there would actually be this uh, incentive. And so it turns out that this is actually what happened uh, in the ancient world. And similarly, in medieval Europe, serfs could actually go to the master and say, okay, let's end this arrangement, right? It's not benefiting you that much. I'll make you a lump sum payment, and then I'll get emancipated. Or actually, in England, what happened was the payments became so unimportant to the lords that they, they simply let them lapse, right? Uh, what actually happened in the English case was that that robot labor, that kind of forced, coerced labor from the serfs, what the lords agreed to do instead was just take a, an annual payment. And then they hired free workers to actually do the work. <laughs> and it was more efficient to do that. And they would actually accept a payment that was half the equivalent of a day's wages in order to buy out that labor because it was done so poorly when you actually had to coerce people to do it. And so you actually see that the, the market mechanism in itself should also end systems like slavery. Now, in the US South, the question is, well, why didn't slavery end then? It turns out that there isn't actually evidence in the US South that slavery was an inefficient system. The shocking finding of historians looking at slavery in the South was that slave farms in the South were more productive than free farms in the North. <laughs> that they had devised in the South a way of, of operating slavery that was quite cruel, but was actually quite efficient in terms of the output of that society. And in fact, one of the, the interesting things in the US South is that the output of the economy declined in the areas that were heavily slave after the end of slavery, right? Because the masters were able to extract so much labor from the slaves under that system, even though they continued with cotton cultivation and essentially the same population was occupying the same land, uh, output actually declined quite significantly in places like Mississippi after the end of slavery because of the efficiency of the, the owners under the, the slave system in terms of just extraction of surplus. Uh, so, so the question then would be, why would inefficient institutions then persist, right? Why wouldn't there always be this erosion of inefficient institutions? Because any inefficient institution presents the possibility of a deal, right? Similarly, uh, you know, suppose you had medieval guilds that were monopolizing trade in a city and you know, if that was to their advantage, but to the disadvantage of the citizens who had to buy cloth or other goods in the city, the city could have done a deal with the, the guild and simply said, we want to open up the market here, but we'll make you a payment to buy out your rights. Right? And, and if it's a big, good enough deal for the citizenry, we should be able to make you a payment that would make you feel quite happy about ending this uh, monopoly in this case, okay? And so any time you have an inefficient institution, you actually have this possibility of different parties getting together and deriving a profit, actually, uh, from that uh, transaction. Now, why would then, what's the possibility 
that inefficient institutions would actually persist. What would actually have to happen is the inability to enforce deals after they're made. How would that arise? So consider, for example, the US South or Eastern Europe in the 19th century, which both had serf or slave systems. And so you could think of, here's the, the move that the masters are going to make in these systems. They could keep the system. And then let's imagine them, they get a payoff of one, and the serfs get a payoff of zero. Okay? And so they're getting a profit from keeping the system, and the serfs get nothing. They just get their subsistence under the systems. Or you could free your workers. And you could free your workers with the idea of let's do a deal whereby you compensate us for freeing you, and in return you get to work as a free worker and you're going to earn enough income that will easily pay off that compensation. Or it could be you know, the government will impose a tax on everyone in order to pay off the owners of the slaves, and then the idea would be that everyone on net will gain. Right? But this, the simplest idea is that the workers themselves have to buy their own freedom. Okay? And they should be able to do that if slavery is an inefficient system. But the problem is that the ex-slaves in this case now maybe have the possibility of making choices of their own. And so there would be two possibilities. One is that they keep the deal, and then the masters get two and the slaves get one. Right? So everyone's better off right, under this arrangement. So the masters are more than compensated, and the ex-slaves are more than compensated. Right? And so this is an emancipation where the slaves pay for their own emancipation. Right? And they pay that by agreeing to pay special taxes or special payments to the lords in exchange for being freed. But there's another real possibility, which is that the slaves would renege seize all of the benefits of the arrangement, and then leave the masters worse off. And so the argument would be the case where you would get the persistent of, persistence of inefficient institutions would be one where you can't make a binding deal. That is, the, comp the, 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 the gainers here can't enter into a binding arrangement with the losers that they'll compensate them. And the reason for that would be if most of the society is slave and now you free the slaves, <laughs> now they're powerful enough to say, we didn't like that earlier deal. <laughs> We're going to expropriate you. Uh, and so the deal will not go through. And so the conditions for the, the continuation of inefficient institutions, the, the classic condition would actually have to be that the group that's gaining can only hold on to its gains by maintaining the institution in that form. That if they allow the move to the efficient institution, they won't be able to arrange a binding compensation because other people will now get political power and will be able to undercut the deal. And actually, we see this uh, problem in dramatic form exactly at this present moment. So you know that uh, Zimbabwe has been driven uh, into economic misery by the activities of Robert Mugabe and his henchmen. Okay? And so it now has hyperinflation. It used to be one of the richest countries in southern Africa. It's now heavily dependent on food aid. Uh, there's incredible poverty, uh, huge rampant unemployment. The society is a mess. right? And the thing, though, that stops that, you know, and the thing is that even the, the, the rulers of Zimbabwe are not making that much out of this mess. Right? They're gaining something, but they're not that well off. The question is, why can't you just arrange to say to Mugabe and his henchmen, OK, here's the deal. You each get a million dollars in return for giving up power. Right? Uh, the problem is that because there's a legal system in Zimbabwe, if the opposition took control, it would be impossible to stop amnesty, to produce amnesty and stop uh, prosecution. 
against these guys, or the opposition is unwilling to guarantee amnesty because of the, the incredible crimes that were committed by the previous regime. And so that's actually what's paralyzing the situation in the country. It, it would only take a very small amount of money if you could just buy out the thugs who are actually running the society, right? And it's actually it's the chief of the army and the police, and, and they're very concerned. They know exactly the problem. And they've been engaged in negotiations about what the buyout would be in order for them to give up power. But the idea would be that if you can't arrange these buyouts, so one of the things, you, for example, you'd need in this case is there needs to be another country that they can move to <laughs> that will not extradite them back to the home country. But now with the actual spread of uh, international jurisdiction in human rights cases, that is actually going to make it much harder to arrange these deals in order to get rid of corrupt regimes. Right? So when Haiti, you know, when, when baby Doc Duvalier was in power, another corrupt, uh, incompetent ruler, he eventually was allowed to move to a chateau in France <laughs> and protected from prosecution uh, by the French under a deal that simply said, you get to hold on to a bunch of your ill-gotten money and, and you have to leave and you have to live in the chateau. Right? Uh, but now it's actually much harder to do this because of the spread of international jurisprudence where Belgian judges are now saying, well, we're going to try baby Doc for all of the obvious and evident crimes that he committed. But this actually, would, it would have to be some situation like this that would actually keep institutions inefficient in the pre-industrial world. It has to be that somehow the rulers in all these earlier societies kept very poor institutions because that was the condition of them remaining in power. If they were to liberalize the economic institutions, then a middle class would arise which would depose the existing thuggish ruling class and they feared the rise of that other group and so consequently they preferred to suppress economic activity because what they weren't concerned about was the size of the social pie, what they were concerned about was their bit here. Right? And even if you could have vastly increased this pie because you couldn't actually make an arrangement whereby they would get their share. They were actually going to block uh, progress. Okay? And so, as I say, in order that institutions are really going to explain the lack of growth in the world before uh, 1800, you actually have to have this complicated political economy. Right? And, and one of the puzzles we'll see when we get to the Industrial Revolution in Britain is that that doesn't exist in the case of Britain. That essentially this ruling class had disappeared or been bought out hundreds of years before the Industrial Revolution. And actually I have some new evidence on that to do with people's surnames again <laughs> that actually shows that the, can, you can see the displacement of this me medieval ruling class and the takeover of the middle classes in England already by the 15th century. But the Industrial Revolution doesn't come till 300 years later. And so the interesting puzzle, as you see when we look at Britain, is that this type of explanation, it might work in Russia in the 19th century. It would absolutely work in something like the US South. Because the problem in the US South was that even had slavery been inefficient, the owners did not want an emancipated, free black population living in the South. They feared that they would then be expropriated by that population, right? And, and I mean, uh, the, they, they had every reason to, to fear that people would not say, okay, we agree to a, a social system where you have all the property and we have nothing. <laughs> and, and, that was, and, and that's fine, we'll live with that, right? Uh, and so you do get societies where this problem arises, you get it in the modern world. But the interesting thing we'll see about Britain in the Industrial Revolution was it was absolutely not a society that faced that problem. It had surmounted those difficulties long before the Industrial Revolution, hundreds and hundreds of years before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the multiple equilibria idea, the, the main, let me just erase this. The main idea that people have had here is this idea of the change in the human agent, right, and the investment in uh, human capital. Okay? And as you say, you can see in Britain at the time of the Industrial Revolution that it, it's moved to much higher levels of education and knowledge than all almost all other pre-industrial societies. Um, the, and the way that argument has been framed is it's a decision 
to move for, to quality as opposed to quantity in terms of the number of children you have. And so the, the famous uh, economist who's written about this is the Nobel Prize winner, Gary Becker. And as I say, one of his famous ideas is that children vary on two dimensions, right? If you just measure the number of children people have and, and think of that as, you know, that's what their consumption of children is. I mean, again, in economics, everything is a good, <laughs> right? So economists look on children as, you know, being the equivalent of, you know, a car or a consumer durable or something like that. How much of the services of children do you want to consume, right? And you have to think about that. It's a commodity. It has a price, okay? And then people have to decide how much of this commodity they want to consume. And so what Becker emphasized is that we tend to look at children measured just in terms of quantity, but that there's a huge quality dimension, right? And that when you're looking at the total, I and mean, the puzzle as we move from the earlier world to the modern world is that people seem to be, when they get more income, they want more of most goods. But for some reason, they want many fewer of, uh, much less of children as a good. And this is a puzzle because typically the goods that people want less of are things like potatoes, beans, uh, you know, uh, stuff that is, is a, an inferior good, something that, that delivers not very, you know, that there are better substitutes for. And so the question that the puzzle for the modern world is, why as if we got richer, did we not say, well, we want more and more children, right? I mean, children have their blessings, their benefits. Uh, why is it that people actually seem to be switching away from children? And Becker's argument was, well, this is only a puzzle simply because you focus on this one dimension of children uh, quantity. In terms of quality, in the modern world, we consume many more of child services than we did in the earlier world because we invest a huge amount more in children in the modern world. We give them a huge amount more of consumption. We invest a huge amount more in their education. And so then the other thing that Becker wanted to understand is, well, why would people switch from quantity towards quality? And that's going to be dependent on the argument is, well, what's the return to quality in terms of how the children do on the labor market, how much they're going to earn later? And the idea is that in our society, you'll do much better in terms of the prospects of your children having two children who you invest a huge amount in than having 10 who you just toss onto the labor market without any education or training. <clears throat> and so that that's the switch that people have made, and they've made it in response to two things. One is the signal from the marketplace in terms of the rewards of, uh, for quality. But a second one is that uh, as time costs go up, one of the effects of economic growth is you know, that we've expanded everything in terms of economic possibilities, but we haven't changed the number of hours there are in a day. So that time becomes the most precious commodity in high income societies, right? And it reflects in various things. For example, uh, I like to read. I could easily buy today, right, and not even really notice it, enough reading material for the entire rest of my life, <laughs> right? The constraint on how much you can read has nothing to do with price anymore. It's to do with time. And systematically, as we move to richer societies, we're going to move our consumption towards goods that are less time intensive. And one of the problems of children is that they are very time intensive good, particularly if you invest in quantity, right? And so another thing you can try and do then is simply move to having fewer children, but investing a lot more in the, the, the quality of those children. And so there's been a lot of discussion then about this. This is a very important, very dramatic transformation between societies where people have, average woman has five children, to the modern world where the average woman has two or less children. And the argument's been made that that switch from quantity to quality had a dramatic impact in terms of the performance of the human agent. And that's what allowed the rise of the modern world, right? It's modern childcare. It's modern attention to children. It's the incredible enrichment that we get. It's actually transformed the human agent and made people much more capable of analyzing the economy, of producing economic growth. And so there's been a lot of attention as to this, as in some sense it must be one of the fundamental 
causes of growth, right? Because it's still the case that if we look at very poor societies in Africa, they're still very strong on the quantity dimension and very low on the quality dimension, right? And so if we look across countries, you can actually see that poor societies still have this older pattern, whereas we have this very different pattern in the modern world. And so that's then been promoted as that must lie behind modern economic growth. The dramatic problem for the Industrial Revolution in Britain, though, is that the quantity of children actually increased in the period of the Industrial Revolution. Fertility actually rose even after modern growth had started. And so if we draw a kind of a timeline here, where this is time, and this is the birth rate in Britain, and we start, say, in 1700, 1800, 1900, what you actually see in the Industrial Revolution period is The birth rate looks like this. It actually peaks in Britain soon after. It's about 1815 is the very peak of the birth rate. But it's right in the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Actual birth rates have increased in the society. It then falls back so that by 1880, it's back at its pre-industrial level. But it's really only around 1890 that you get what's called the demographic transition. And then very quickly, the average number of births per woman falls from about five down to about uh, three and then down to two, right? So by 1920, most of that transformation has occurred in something like Britain. But it's 100 years after the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And so it's just a huge problem. <laughs> in terms of we know that this is this transition, this demographic transition is a key element of the modern world. And actually we'll talk a little bit about the social effects of the Industrial Revolution. One of the dramatic effects that that's had is because it's kept population within limits in the very high income countries, it's reduced the pressure on land and natural resources in the world. That's actually allowed for very rapid growth. And it's also allowed for much greater equality within these societies because land used to be something that was held incredibly unequally. Land simply became unimportant. And so it increased the importance of wages and incomes in the modern world. And it actually made this a much more equal world than one where land actually would become a very scarce resource. And so it's very important in how we got to live in these very high income societies, seemingly largely unconstrained by resources. It somehow must have something to do with the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> but it, if, as I say, if you ended history here, you would never have suspected that this event was going to happen. <laughs> right? And, and it's, it occurs all across Europe, roughly the same time uh, here. There's one country that it actually occurs in much earlier, which is France, where it starts about 1770, okay? No one knows what's different about the French that would lead them to experience this demographic. And it occurs much more slowly in France, but all the way through the 19th century, they're reducing and reducing their fertility. But as I say, for the rest of the world, it really doesn't start till here. And the puzzle, as I say, in terms of this multiple equilibria is that it's something that's completely unconnected to the onset of the Industrial Revolution. It was done under the old democratic, demographic regime. Uh, and so we, we think we have to somehow explain this as a result of the Industrial Revolution, but it's not going to ex in itself explain the Industrial Revolution. Right? And as I say, that's why the Industrial Revolution is such a difficult event to explain because a lot of things that would seem to make sense <laughs> and seem to be obvious about what's happening here simply don't work. Okay? By the way, why did, uh, I'll come back and talk about this, why did fertility increase so much in this period in Britain? It was um, simply because, remember, in the pre-industrial period, fertility is controlled by the age of marriage and the fraction of people getting married. For some reason, with the onset of industrialization, the age of marriage actually declined in Britain. Uh, that was an ad, enough to add almost an extra birth per woman in the Industrial Revolution period. And at the same time, the fraction of women marrying also increased in British society. And again, you think, well, that's simply going to be the result of the Industrial Revolution. It's going to be these new towns, these new cities, 
presented all these new economic opportunities, and so people are rushing to get married. It turns out in the most remote rural villages in England, exactly at the time of the Industrial Revolution, people started marrying at a younger age. They all got the signal, right? Out in the countryside, in the cities, <laughs> somehow all across the country, <laughs> they, some, they got the signal about 1760, which is marry a couple of years younger, <laughs> right? Or, or marry more often. And so that's another then huge puzzle about the Industrial Revolution is that it's actually associated with this interesting demographic change, but in no obvious way, <laughs> right? that these two events coincide. We'll see that there are other events that coincide in Britain as well. And the mystery of the Industrial Revolution is that some reason in 1760 in Britain, after 600 years of stasis, lots of different things began to change about British society, right? including demography, transportation, uh, 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 agriculture. Uh, there's lots of different things that start changing in this period and, and connecting them up into some story as to well, why did the world start changing around about then uh, is exceed exceedingly difficult. Um, the last thing, just to finish up here in terms of, and then so next time we'll talk exactly about the Industrial Revolution. In terms of exogenous growth, as I say, the problem that you run into <coughs> is that if we were to predict, based on the size of the population in the world, what the, great, the rate of growth of efficiency would be, and we were to plot the data from the pre-industrial world, we'd expect a relationship that looked kind of like this. As I say, greater growth of efficiency would increase as a function of the square root of the population. And so you actually see in the pre-industrial world as population is expanding at a world level, rates of growth of efficiency are actually moving up somewhat slowly, right? But what it would predict as we got towards 1800 would simply be this continual gradual increase in the rates of efficiency advance in the world economy. Instead, what you see is that the path heads off like this. And so it's just going to be very hard, I mean, to tell a story about population where you get these gradual gains as you have more population, but then somehow you hit a threshold and rates of productivity growth actually increase very greatly. Okay? And then actually what happens is it kind of stabilizes at this new higher level. Okay? And so it's not that rates of efficiency growth have just gone on continually increasing. They start slowly in the Industrial Revolution, but by about 1850, they reach kind of modern rates. And it's the kind of rate you observe in modern America, or the frontier of technology, seems to expand at roughly this rate of one or one and a half percent a year since the Industrial Revolution. It starts slowly, it gets up to that level. And as I say, again, a problem with any kind of endogenous growth explanation is what is going to be changing slowly in the pre-industrial world that can then trigger a relatively sudden change in the rate of technological advance. That really seems to suggest the multiple equilibria or exogenous shock, but you see all of these explanations have uh, problems. Okay, so on Friday, we'll be up to, we'll actually go through the Industrial Revolution itself. I'll also do some more of that on Monday of next week. And then we'll talk about the social consequences of the Industrial Revolution as the last uh, couple of lectures in the class. And also, I, uh, I don't have some prepared questions for this section of the class, but I'll try and make up some tonight or something like that and post them on the web on this chapter so that you have some, some idea of the stuff that you need to know. Okay? <laughs>